it is my real pleasure to present our honorary degree recipient and today's commencement speaker. Will Ms. Helen Zia please rise? Father President, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, it is my privilege to present for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, Ms. Ellen Zia, author and activist. Ms. Sharice Kimura, Electronic Resources Librarian, Gleason Library, Getchke Center, will read the citation. Ms. Kimura. Helen Zia, you are a brilliant writer, a tireless activist, an award-winning journalist and scholar. For decades, you have been a powerful and persistent voice in the national discourse on human, civil, and women's rights, while countering hate, violence, racism, and homophobia. A change agent, an advocate, and leader, building solidarity among and across marginalized communities and raising awareness among mainstream audiences. You attended Princeton on a full scholarship where you burnished your values protesting inequality and the Vietnam War on campus and helped to found the Asian American Students Association. You graduated in 1973 as a member of the university's first class of women. You became a community organizer in Boston and moved to Detroit in the early 1980s to work in the Chrysler factory, joining the United Auto Workers Union. As a leader in the Vincent Chin case in which a Chinese American man died as a result of racially motivated violence in 1982, you built bridges between Asian American communities and the grassroots effort to seek justice for Vincent Chin. When you launched your journalism career, you found your voice, your purpose, and your passion, and continued your advocacy through writing, rising to the position of executive editor of Ms. Magazine. Your exploration of identity and intersections as a woman a feminist, a lesbian, a daughter of Chinese immigrants, and an American has been multi-layered, incisive, and influential. Your lifetime of activism traces its deep roots to the racism, bias, and ethnic stereotyping you experienced in childhood. You were one of six children born in New Jersey to Chinese immigrant parents where Asian Americans were a small minority and subject to post-World War II ignorance and insults. You are the author of the groundbreaking book, Asian American Dreams, The Emergence of an American People, a finalist for USF's Kiriyama Pacific Rim Book Prize. You co-authored My Country Versus Me with Wen Ho Lee, a Taiwanese American scientist falsely accused of spying at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Unaware until adulthood of your mother's harrowing story of fleeing Shanghai in 1949, you tell her gripping tale and those of other emigrants in your riveting new book, Last Boat Out of Shanghai, the epic story of the Chinese who fled Mao's revolution. Your advocacy aligns with our mission to nurture graduates who respect, defend, and promote the dignity of every person while, making, while working to make positive change in the world. As a longtime activist and community organizer, you speak out on issues of social justice, encouraging others to do the same, always reminding us about what is important. Your decades of scholarship, journalism, and activism have been widely recognized with distinguished scholar-in-residence appointments and many other honors. That all may know of our esteem for you and our strong support of your unrelenting fight against racism, injustice, and exclusion, 
your fierce defense of the dignity of each person and your lifelong example of taking action to right wrongs, the University of San Francisco does therefore confer upon Helen Zia the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto, given this 18th day of May in the year of our Lord, 2019, and of the University, the 164th in San Francisco, California. Wow. Members of the Board of Trustees, President Fitzgerald, Provost Heller, Dean Comperi, faculty and staff of the university, families, friends, and fellow graduates, good afternoon. All right. I am so proud to be among you to celebrate the graduation of these amazing recipients of advanced degrees in arts and science from this distinguished institution. Each of you has given blood, sweat, and tears to get to this moment. And of course, we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, including family members, teachers, spiritual guides, mentors, and those of our beloved communities. They all deserve our deepest gratitude. My thanks to Masa Ashabi for your inspiring words, and to Sharice Kimura for that overwhelming citation. Yes, I've done a few things in my life thus far, and the journey has always been challenging. When I was a kid growing up in New Jersey, I felt like an alien from outer space because there were so few Asian Americans outside of Hawaii and ghettos like Chinatowns, Japantowns, Little Indias, and the like. We were truly invisible, not seen, not heard. So I became the quiet Asian American kid who couldn't even correct the teacher who mispronounced my name for years. In college, I gradually learned to speak up. As Ms. Kimura said, I became active in the pressing issues of the day, fighting racism, sexism, war, standing up for human rights. It was a time much like today. I found a community of other students who wanted to make positive change. But until then, my only goal was to get my college degree and to have a life that wasn't hand to mouth like my family's. I wanted to make a difference, but I had no idea how. Like so many children of immigrants, I took classes in the subjects that I cared about. For me, that was history, politics, sociology, and I took the minimum number of pre-med courses. Well, I got into medical school, but unlike all of you, I did not complete my degree. It was so clear that I was on the wrong path, so I quit. You can imagine the child of immigrants telling my parents that I was quitting medical school. Yes, they were very unhappy, but I knew that the world did not need more a doctor who hated her job. Instead, I threw myself into community organizing, and that was well before President Obama made it a path to the White House. I helped to integrate the construction industry by getting a job as a laborer those high-paying jobs until then had only been available to Anglo men. No women or men of, uh, men of color needed to apply. My tools were a pick and a shovel, and people would stop in their tracks just to watch me work. When a friend suggested that uh, to understand social change in America, I should go to the heartland of America, I took that advice and I moved to Detroit, Michigan. Within two weeks, I was hired by Chrysler at a stamping plant, pounding out steel hoods, doors, 
and other parts that go into making a car. By then, my parents were convinced that I had lost my mind, but at least I could finally send some money home to help my family out. There was nothing conventional about the path that I took, but I'd like to offer humbly some lessons that I've drawn from my journey. First, to envision the difference that you can make in this world. Be open to the possibilities, new possibilities, because life and history never move in a straight line. I worked in the auto plant for two years. It was an incredible experience to get to know and befriend people who were so unlike my family and different from me, to find compassion in their joys and woes, and to discover what moved them to take action and make change. But stuff happens. I got laid off from that job along with millions of other American workers in that great depression of the 1980s. For months, I stood in long unemployment lines, and just like everyone else, I had to figure out what the next part of my journey was going to be. I floundered, but eventually I realized I wanted to tell the stories of the black, white, Arab American people I worked with who were ignored and invisible, yet suffering from the failed economy. So I began my journalism career with zero experience and zero connections. I sent out hundreds of query letters proposing stories that I wanted to tell. Every one of those letters was rejected, except one. It only takes one. If you fall down eight times, the important thing is that you get up nine. And no, I did not get to write the story that I first proposed, but in time, I did. Then in 1982, a young Asian American named Vincent Chin had his brains beaten out by two white auto workers in a terrible hate crime. I was very aware of the anti-Asian hatred and xenophobia from the auto industry that I had worked in. Yet the Asian American community in Detroit was so small that I didn't even know it existed, and I felt compelled to learn more. There were many zigs and zags, but through it all, I continued to uh, pursue my vision to shine a light on the communities that were rendered invisible. I found my way to Ms. Magazine, the feminist publication, and began writing books, and could finally bring my whole personhood into my work as an advocate, a journalist, and a queer person of color. Second, I learned that to make a difference, you have to step out of your comfort zone. The hate killing of Vincent Chin was tragedy enough, but then the judge sentenced his killers to probation, letting them off scot-free. The tiny Asian American community was shocked into action when everybody felt like they had a bullseye on their heads. Yet, at one of the first meetings to plan what could be done, the attorneys there each said, it's impossible to change a judge's sentence. As the lawyers spoke, I could feel the energy seeping out of the room. Though I was told that reporters should not get involved, I raised my hand and I said, it might not be possible to change the sentence, but the world needs to know that Asian Americans are not okay with this. The energy in the room changed again and people started talking about what could be done instead of what could not. Now, I don't tell this story to pat myself on the back. All I did was raise my hand. It's something that everybody here can do. And if you knew that raising your hand could make a difference in this world, wouldn't you? My journalism career did carry on and I also became part of a new civil rights movement of Asian Americans standing together for the first time. Even my parents approved. In your life journey, you will often face choices that are outside of your comfort zone. I have. For example, in 2008, I was invited to be a torchbearer 
for the Beijing Olympics. There were angry protests against China and its human rights violations in Tibet. It would have been easier for me to refuse. Yet I disagreed with the polarizing attacks and I decided to carry the torch for marriage equality because Proposition 8 was threatening to ban our gay and lesbian families. But I wrote an essay saying why I made that choice. And it went viral all the way to China. I was featured on CNN International talking about human rights and gay marriage. And this, too, was aired repeatedly in China. The magic never happens inside your comfort zone. It happens outside. You don't have to be an outspoken activist, but doing nothing is a choice. You can simply raise your hand. Lastly, your education doesn't stop today. Every part of our journey offers new opportunities to grow and learn. If you dig deep enough, your own family stories will connect you to the world around you. I was in my 50s, and my mother was in her 70s when she revealed to me the truth of her life, that she had been an abandoned child, not once, but twice, because of war and poverty and because she was a girl. That revelation pushed me to write my latest book, The Last Boat Out of Shanghai. And while I was doing my research, I discovered that my parents had been flagged by the INS, the precursor to ICE, for overstaying their visas after China's communist revolution. My father had been arrested, and they expected to be deported. After many hearings, their last INS letter said, you are here illegally, and you should be deported. However, deportation and separation would cause, quote, extreme and unusual hardship, unquote, to your American-born children. That was me and my brothers in diapers. So they were allowed to stay. And that was at the height of the anti-communist and anti-Chinese McCarthy era. Today is worse than that, with children being ripped from their parents. And although I always stood in solidarity with immigrants, refugees, and dreamers, this new information made the connection even deeper between the stories of seven decades ago and today's global refugee crisis. My mother's revelation also drove home the privilege that education is. I had always known that my mother struggled with English, especially with reading. Her schooling stopped at the third grade because of war and chaos. But after my mother died two years ago, I discovered how hard she fought to keep on learning. When we were cleaning out my mother's things, I found notebooks listing words and phrases in English with their meanings in Chinese, all in her very careful handwriting. She had kept these notebooks ever since my youngest brother, Haddon, was in high school. He was the only one of six kids to realize that he could actually help our mother improve our, her English. It was so important to her that she continued trying to learn new words every day until the end of her life. So when you have your diplomas in hand, please think of those who don't have the formal schooling that you and I have, and how much more of a difference you can make because of your excellent USF education. I invite you to envision your path as part of the larger world around you. Step out of your comfort zone and use the opportunities you have to make a difference. Indeed, these are trying times. Most of you graduates have only known the fractured world of this post 9-11 time, but change will come on your watch in your time. Because take a look around you. The numbers of people of color and people of conscience reflect the America that is already here and will continue to become that beautiful majority mosaic.
on your watch. This trend cannot be stopped, no matter how the forces of supremacy might try. Your hard-fought USF degree gives you the possibility and the power to be an agent of change. The arc of history will bend toward justice, especially if you raise your hands to help bend that arc. So stay woke and use your knowledge to make your life journey count. Thank you for this great honor. Thank you for your kind attention, and congratulations to all the graduates. Thank you.